Hello, I'm Lucas. That is Jeff. This is Make Your Own Damn Podcast. Jeff, what's going on tonight? Oh my god, I am so excited for this episode. Oh, we have a lot to go over here. We have a zero-budget movie that ends up becoming an urban legend. Ends up, we're going to have conspiracy theories in this episode. We're going to have the U.S. military making commentary on this movie in this episode. <laughs> we are going to have a, this is going to be in terms of the story around the movie, this in many ways is going to be one of the more insane episodes that we have recorded. And I am so excited to share with you all the things I found in research because it's going to get weird and it's going to get crazy emphasis on crazy. Hell We're yeah. talking about UFO abduction, a.k.a. the McPherson tapes or the McPherson tape. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, I keep wanting to say tapes, but it's tape. It's singular. Yeah. Now. For anyone who may not be aware of it, I have uh, the description pulled up from the uh, Blu-ray here that was uh, distributed by Agfa Agfa plus Bleeding Skull. Um, I'm not entirely sure who they are, but regardless, here's the description. A decade before the Blair Witch Project redefined the horror landscape, there was the McPherson tape. On October 8th, 1983, the McPherson family... That's not their names in the movie. We'll go over that in a moment. The McPherson family gathered together to celebrate the fifth birthday of Michelle, the littlest member of their household. Everything was captured on VHS by Michael McPherson, not the character's name in the movie, and his new camcorder, including the alien invasion. Shot for $6,000, actually it was (laughs) (laughs) 6500 Man, there's a lot of errors in this description. The first time filmmaker Dean Alito, I believe I'm pronouncing his name right, in 1989, this movie blends the production design of a J.C.'s haunted house, I don't know what a J.C.'s haunted house is, with a dead serious tone to forge a fun hypnotic nightmare that upends the concept of reality. So that's a description. This is a 1989 found footage horror film about a family holding a birthday party when essentially aliens land nearby and aliens torment the family. That's that's yeah. what the movie is. That's the whole movie. It's extremely low budget. It was filmed in uh, 1988, not 89. Eight, 89 was when it was released, or actually was supposed to be released. We'll get to that. Um, it was actually filmed in 80 in 88, and for six thousand five hundred dollars was the exact total amount spent on it and i was curious so i put it into an inflation uh, calculator it's just shy of seventeen thousand dollars in um modern american currency so to give you an idea seventeen thousand dollars to make a movie here this is a very very low budget movie not the lowest budgeted movie that we've covered on this show no by not even by not even close we've covered movies way less money than than this yeah. but this is still on the extreme low end this is something that a lot of people a, a lot of people have like this amount in their savings like if they want to blow through their life savings they could make your theory, own damn movie make this movie yeah um and so um what, what's your history with this movie lucas um so surprisingly the fact even though like i spent a good amount of my youth like pretty into the whole alien thing um i uh i had never heard of this movie until shutter got it a few years ago and um that was when i watched it for the first time um so yeah i mean it's really not that extensive at all i guess (laughs) Um, this is a movie i always heard about and i I would say it's kind of an it was an infamous movie and um, because of its connection to UFO circles. And we'll get to that later in the episode. And um, I thought I hadn't seen it when Shudder added it and I went to watch it. And I realized while watching it that I had seen it before. I have no idea when I saw it or that, um, but I had seen it. And no, I'm not thinking of the remake. I did watch the remake and we'll get to the remake um in preparation for this episode i had never definitely never seen the remake before um but the fact that i was watching i'm like wait a minute i've seen this movie shows about how much of an impact it made on me um 
first off, I want to say, I don't think this is a very good movie. Huh. Um, I, I liked it better this time, the second time. I've got to, I've got to be honest. I did like it better the second time around, um, you know, watching it for this episode. Um, there's a lot about it I don't like. But there's some things I do like as well. Um, I'll start with. You want me to start with the bad? No, start with what you like. Okay. So, one of the things that I really liked about it, and this is probably the main thing I liked about it, is, and it's weird because I know this is a a horror film, but it's not. The things I like about it are not really the horror at all like i actually would argue that when the scary stuff starts happening it gets a lot less interesting um but i thought the way like and and i don't know if it was because they were just improv amateur actors improving or what but like it just like it's probably the most like some of the most like realistic dialogue i've seen like it you know, like when they're just like sitting around having dinner and talking, like I was just like, this is like a very accurate depiction of what it was like to have dinner with your extended family at that time period. But, or, you know, because I, I, I guess I, I would have, I'm about the age of that, or I would have been a, when this movie came out, I was. Or, or was supposed to come out or whatever. I was five, and the main kid in this movie is five. And, like, so, I don't know. Like, it just felt very realistic to me, which I thought was a nice touch. I don't know how, how they got that realism. Like, I don't know. Well, that's what... funny you should say yeah. about the improv aspect, because, mm-hmm. and how they got that realism, the movie itself only had, I got this from an interview with the director, only had, I believe it was around a 20-page script. It was more of an outline of what the movie was going to be. Okay. And um, he wrote up note cards for all the actors for each scene that there were three things, roughly around three things that were supposed to happen in each scene. All the actors he hired were hired from Im- improv scenes. Okay. Like improv communities, improv troops. So that was literally part of the filming process was, all right, in this scene, we need to relay this information. Everyone go. Yeah, it's crazy that I could spot that, like even not knowing that, right? Like, I'm... And, and for the record, that was also the same technique that was used on a decade later with the Blair Witch Project. Yeah. And that's yeah, why the Blair, like, the Blair Witch Project is very much credited as having very naturally sounding dialogue. And it's for that reason is that the actors are, like, improving And not – there are actually people who know how to improv. Like, they're not just a random person making up shit on the spot. But yeah. I thought that was a really that... strong, like, aspect of the movie. Um, and then this one, I – I'm like hesitant to even bring it up because it's not really like a point. Like, I don't know. Like, it's kind of, it's just weird. Like I just, the, um, the, uh, qual like the camcorder, like look, like mm-hmm. I just, I just look, I just like the way it looks. <laughs> like I just do. Like, I don't know if it's because like, I like, I don't know if it's like a sentimental thing. Like my parents had a camcorder and all our home movies looked like that. Or I just, I don't know. It just looks, I don't know. I just like the look of it. And and I think that added to the realism of it. Um, but, oh, I really wish it was a short film. <laughs> yes. It, um, I mean, uh, it's only just over an hour long. And it still felt it's really still long. long. <laughs> it runs into the problem, and this is what I don't like about it, is there's a lot of filler in the movie. Yes. And yes. it's what the filler is meant to do, though, is it's meant to be setting the stage that this is a real family get-together, and this is real family um, 
like home videos that we're watching and this is what the people would record be recording that is all true and i understand that when this movie was made this is kind of actually like a groundbreaking idea that like this movie was really ahead of its time found footage of what would become like still to this day a common technique in horror films it was way way ahead of its time yeah but just because it was first and before everyone else doesn't mean it did it best and no, no, no. there's yeah. a lot of things that the director is playing with here and he's one of if not the first director that, to play with a lot of these techniques the other people would later go on to do much much better um like structurally in filmmaking wise this actually has a lot in common with the blair witch project just 10 years later blair witch project is i'd argue infinitely better in every single category Well, because i think like i think it's a pacing issue like i think i it's think the very, blair, this movie has really rough pacing like really i think the pacing. blair witch like even in the uh, what what makes blair witch work where this one doesn't is that the blair witch um even in the um i don't know like all the expository scenes where it's just the characters or whatever like you're still getting little breadcrumbs that something is going something's to up happen. something's up yes like, yes yeah the Whereas, interviews with like the townsfolk in the first uh in the first act of yes, the movie exactly. and they're talking to some of the townsfolk and things start to go slightly wrong in the second act and like yeah you know there, there yeah. isn't there is an escalation and there is things that like if you pay attention you're rewarded for paying attention that like yes something's not right this is just watching family videos until the aliens get introduced yeah and and i guess if there had been like some hints that something was going to happen like during the family stuff like it, it would have you know felt a lot more i don't know just paced better because like when the aliens do show up i mean the movie goes from like i don't know like i feel like yeah, I, I just feel like it could have been a short film. I mean, I don't, I, I like, I think like a like if this had been a thirty minute, I don't know. I mean, if you want to see how this thirty minute short would would have been best for this. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, if you want to see like how this gets done right, watch the Blair Witch and then watch, you know, uh, Alien Slumber Party or whatever the oh, the Alien Slumber stuff. Party Massacre. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that one's fuck. Oh man, from VHS too. I love that short. Love that short. Mm -hmm. An alien invasion, alien home invasion, shot from the perspective of a dog. The yeah. dog has a camcorder taped to its back, and you're watching the footage that the dog accidentally recorded. Love that short. So good. Totally. But this, like, I mean, if they had even like had like just like, just something in the beginning to like. I think it would have bolstered the uh, already strong exposition. Um, and then like, you know, and then they could have, you know, gone crazy in the last act or whatever, or they could have just done a short film and, and seriously condensed all the exposition. And, you know, I mean, yeah, I don't know. This is a first timers. Um, like this is a, uh, the director who also wrote it. Uh, it was his very first movie and it shows that, like there's a lot of lessons in here of like the the phrase in the creative arts of kill your darlings over sure. the idea of like don't fall in love with your own art know when when you should put things out of it yeah and now and this isn't necessarily a good thing but i will say that if um it had been more of a story or, you know, or, or, you know, or paced itself better or, you know, all the things we're saying. Um, would it have still become... Are you, about to, are you about to ask me if it was a better movie, would I have liked it better? Or are you about no, to no, ask no. if it was a better movie, would what we're about to get into of yeah. its urban legends have happened? That's what I'm, yeah, I'm absolutely at. not. Absolutely yeah. not. We'll be getting into that. Absolutely not. Because yeah. it is so amateurishly made, allow it to achieve its urban legend status, which we will be getting into. In fact, that's probably going to be most of this episode is what happened to the movie after its release. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, but no, I don't think it would have. Yeah, um, I don't think so either. Um, because, like, I mean, I think, I don't know. Like, I think if something comes out and it's and it dude feels... i got some quotes hold that thought yeah. i got some quotes for you later i got some quotes for you later that you're just hold that thought hold that thought. okay let's just stay on the movie because i don't really feel like i have an awful lot to discuss about the movie itself i mean like there's I said, not much I a... to it i mean it's literally there the really is show up and then there's some screaming and you know. Run, <laughs> running around yeah um the i'm i'm sorry like the special effects in this movie, even for a zero budget movie, look terrible. The aliens yeah. in this movie are like they, Oh they, no. I you, I did a an amateur like I, I helped out with one guy's amateur alien movie several years ago and it the, the effects looked exactly the same <laughs> as, as as this no budget movie that I helped out on. So I, I totally uh, yeah. And it's what's really so funny is like when we get into like what happened to this movie and how it got distributed, and there are people who convince themselves that this movie's real. There's stories yeah. and accounts of people that saw this movie as a child and thought it was the most terrifying thing they've ever seen, and as adults they still like are terrified of the movie. Well, and I'm okay. like, I don't understand. Like, I mean, that this kind isn't of... even. It's barely Halloween costume worthy. I mean, but that sort of tracks, though. Like, if you see it as a kid and, like, some maybe somebody's telling you that it's real. We'll get to know? that. We'll, we'll get to that. We will yeah. get to that. Yeah. And then, yeah. And I'm just saying, like, you know, I could see, like, it being thought of as this scary thing if, like, you know, you thought it was real when you were a kid and then, you okay. know, you're older, still might have some reservations about it. Like, I still get creeped out by... uh Amityville horror, like if I'm watching it under the right circumstances, because when I saw it, I, I saw it under the pretenses that it was a true story. Um, I see the movie that scared me the most as a kid doesn't bother me in the slightest now. And I've probably told the story on the show before, but I'm actually not sure if I have whatever. I'll tell it again if I have um, the movie that traumatized me the most as a child was Gremlins. And people are always like Gremlins. But it's like a comedy. Like, how was that so traumatizing to you? I saw it on TV, and when I turned it on, I only saw the second half. Oh, okay. I only saw yeah. the I, – I did not have any of the comedy or cuteness context to the movie. I just turned it on watching the Gremlins rampage through a town way too young to be seeing that without any context, uh -huh. and it traumatized me. It was years later I watched Gremlins – the full movie and i was like oh my god it's a comedy i had no yeah. idea it was a comedy like oh I thought joe dante just... was good for that though like he would his his i don't know his stuff was always would always tow that line where it was like this is a funny concept and then all of a sudden it turns into like a horror movie like even even something like small soldiers was just like this like Which i've never seen but i keep hearing it's like better than you think it is it's it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun um, it's I enjoyed the hell out of that movie. Um, so, um, should we move on to all the things around this movie? Because that's that's honestly, I feel the like meat that's the of, meat of our episode, and where uh, things get good. This is where things get yeah. really interesting. Okay, first, let's talk about the title of the movie, UFO Abduction. However, it's most commonly known as the McPherson tape. Yes. Um, why is that? Fun fact: nobody actually knows. So, yeah, um, I'm very surprised to learn that the uh, you know w when I learned that the uh, the last name of the family in the in the movie was not McPherson. Like I, I no, assume they're Heese. Heese. Yeah. H e e s e. Van Heese. The Van Heese. That's what it says on Wikipedia. That's yeah. not correct. That's wrong on Wikipedia. Damn. If you go to the actual credits of the movie and also on IMDb, Van Heese is the name of one of the family members. Somebody got confused on Wikipedia. Oh, okay. It's, it's Heese is the na is the last name of the family. Okay, that tracks. Yeah, yeah. somebody somebody got confused on Wikipedia. Um, but it's not McPherson. So why is it known as the McPherson tapes? In the late 90s, there was a remake made, and we'll get to the remake. This this all fits into the this crazy mm -hmm. story. Like, seriously, this story is so wacky that I'm about to <laughs> unload on you here. And the remake fits into it, and we'll get to it. But um, the, re the remakes 
uh, working title was McPherson, the McPherson tape. And uh, the director said uh, it was just solely because why McPherson? Because fear is in the name. Pretty mm -hmm. fucking obvious. However, the the TV studio that the re remake was being done under refused to release it under uh, McPherson tape. So it got renamed to Alien Abduction Incident in Lake County. But this is for the remake. For some reason, though, the name McPherson tape in the late 90s got attached to the original movie. Why oh. and how that happened, nobody, including the writer-director, even knows. Um, did you just, point out, I, I just, because I, I, if you haven't, I want to, I didn't, I didn't hear you point out that the director, uh, writer is the same for the yes. remake. Oh, yes. As yes. I'm sorry. The, yeah. I should have clarified that. It's the same guy remaking his own movie. Um, so it's the same guy. Um, as far as, like I said, how the, uh, how the title McPherson tape got attached to the original to such a degree that, um, the shutter release of it called it the McPherson tape. And there is like um, a DV, I'm sorry, Blu ray release of it that's McPherson tape, like AKA UFO abduction, I think is yeah. what the Blu ray is. Um, I actually just want to double check on that. But um, the, yeah, yeah, it's the Blu ray is the McPherson tape, AKA UFO abduction. That's just what everyone knows under the name of. The director, writer, never called it that. And in fact, that name never even came up until the late 90s when the, when it was a working title for the remake. How people even knew that that was the working title, the writer-director has no idea. It's a complete mystery over how both the UFO community, which we'll get into, and the horror community unanimously renamed a movie. Huh. That's, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> Isn't that weird? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can't like think of is... any other example of anything like that. Yeah. Where even the releases, the home release of the movie renames the movie to the incorrect title that everyone calls it. Yeah, that'd be like, I don't know, like, yeah, I don't know. I can't That's even think crazy. of, I, it, it'd be like, uh, so, so there's lots of times that, like people call songs by like a phrase in the chorus when it's not actually the name of the song. Oh yeah. Um, yeah like yeah. I'm a big ska fan, big ska punk fan. My my Boston's most famous single is called uh um uh the impression I get and everyone wants to call it the knock on wood song. Yeah. It would be like the My My Boston's re releasing the the album Let's Face It that that, that song is from and renaming that song knock on wood mm. but like but I, I i i can only actually think of like examples in music where people will in mass call the song the wrong name um like movies i can't think of any examples of people in mass calling the movie a completely different name to such a degree where like I was like, UFO abduction? Is that the right movie we're supposed to be watching? And I was like, oh, wait, that's the actual name of the McPherson tape? Like, I actually yeah. didn't kind of realize till watching, till researching for this episode that the movie was never officially called the McPherson tape. It'd be like if, I don't know, I guess like if like a bunch, if a bunch of people started calling within the woods Evil Dead and like, you know, when then Evil Dead comes out and uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> I, I get vaguely what you were going at there, but like, yeah, I can't think of any example remotely similar to this. That's just a really weird sign note. And yeah. that's just one weird thing that we're going to get into a whole lot of weird things going on here. <laughs> so let's move on. Movies completed. Um, uh, Don, uh, Dean. Don, Dean, sorry, Dean Alito, um, has been going to Los Angeles to secure distribution, which first off, I find it really weird that the movie is just over an hour long. And as you said, it should have been a short film because he's not at full length yet. It, like he still, it needs to be a minimum 75 minutes for full yeah. length distribution. Well, that, this has come up in many episodes that we've recorded on here of some movies we really like, but we felt like they dragged a bit combat shock being the, that's the main the, one. Yeah. That's the main <laughs> one um, that 
the reason that they drag is the director is open that they had to add in more minutes to get distribution. So 66 minutes, I he like we said, he should have just made a short film. But yeah. he was taking this to uh, L.A. to try to get distribution. Weirdly enough, he actually did get distribution. Um, Axiom Films. Yes. And then, so he sent Axiom Films all of his masters, all of his material, and the distributor burns to the ground. Everything lost. What the Every, fuck? Everything lost. Everything lost. So then an astute listener may be like, wait a minute, if all the masters and everything was lost, how the hell are we able to watch this movie today? Well, it turns out that the distributor, before everything burned down, was sending out VHS screeners to video stores um, to promote the upcoming release. Some of these video stores put up the screeners uh, for rent. Oh. Now, here's a really fucking interesting note. And for the record, it was called UFO abduction at the time. Um, McPherson tape, like I said, did not was not attached to this till the late 90s over a decade after this movie was in its weird distribution which we're going to get into but it was called ufo abduction once again that title change is so weird how everyone just collectively agreed to call this movie by a different title to such a degree that even the director and the home release acknowledge that it's now the name of the movie yeah um that's just so weird to me um, so UFO abduction. Now here's one of the kickers though, for whatever reason, and I don't know if it's because the distributor did not have this part f- uh, like f- finished being made for whatever reason, or if maybe that this was a way that they were keeping track of uh, copies they sent out, um, whatever. The copies of the movie they sent out did not include end credits. Mm-hmm. So it was just the movie without any credits and the movie has no opening credits either so there was nothing attached to this movie over who made it or who was in it so at some point these copies that are out in the wild at these random video stores somebody starts bootlegging them somebody you know has two vcrs at home and tapes it and it starts getting distributed and it specifically starts getting distributed from essentially through essentially the UFO culture scene. Okay. That it's people going to UFO conventions that are passing this movie around to each other. And that's what's keeping the movie alive. Now, I will say in the late 90s, when I was involved in the bootlegging scene, I remember this movie being around in the horror community. The, in the horror community, it was widely known that this was not a r- real alien encounter, that this was like a lo- quote unquote lost uh, found footage movie. I didn't know. I, you know what? I may have seen this movie like back when I was back then. I may have seen it then and it just did not like register to me because I know I saw it before Shutter added it. I just don't have a clue of when I did. Um, that's actually probably the most realistic answer. It's, I probably saw it when I was really involved in that bootlegging community. Um, But it gets real big in the UFO scene. (laughs) And um, I I gotta, I gotta get this. uh, I gotta get this right here. Um, It was screened at the 1993 International UFO Congress Convention held in Las Vegas, <laughs> Nevada, where it apparently caused a gigantic uproar in the crowd of whether or not it was real, with many, many people believing it was real. Yeah, wow. Um, I mean, I guess if it's caused a huge uproar, there must have been some dissenters. I mean, I would hope. There had to be some people in the crowd that's like, that's Halloween costumes. Those yeah. aren't aliens. Like, I mean, like when it comes to like the alien stuff, like I mean, I, 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 I do lean more on the believer side than not. But I also don't consider myself a gullible person. Like I don't know. Like I, like if, if just some anybody was just like, I don't know, just showed me a tape. It's like, hey, look at this alien shit I found. Like I, I don't know. I would just be a little. I'd be like, this looks a little sus. <laughs> 
So I, I have some quotes here that I want to I want to give you here. Um, first off is from a person whose claim to fame is apparently na- uh, a UFO researcher by the name of Tom Dongo. Um, admittedly, I did not look up anything about this guy because, quite frankly, when you're number one uh, credential <laughs> is UFO researcher, I'm not that interested in yeah. what the rest of your credentials are. Um, there is uh, somebody else I'm going to be getting into in a moment that's way more interesting. I had to look them up. But here's some quotes that famed UFO researcher Tom Dongo had to say on the McPherson tape, a.k.a. UFO abduction. Quote, when I first ran across the tape, I was invited over to a friend's house who said he had a very interesting UFO tape. I was stunned, shocked by what I saw. <laughs> I, thought the type, I thought the tape may be real because it could fit in very well with so many UFO alien incidents that I know of. It fit very well, in fact, almost too well. I thought no one could fake something. Um, it, became, it began to seem even more obvious to me that possibly it was an entirely authentic video. And someone, namely, possibly the government, was trying to grab all the copies out there. In the one sequence where I believe it's Jason that's carrying a supposed dead alien, I took photographs of each frame, and in one frame, the eye of the alien is sunken in. When I was at the International UFO Conference, and there was a man standing over my shoulder, as I was going through these prints, and he said, I have seen dead aliens, and that's exactly what happens. When oh, their God. dead eyes get, they, when they are dead, their eyes get concaved like that. Now, later, when, and we're going to get, get to this, this guy essentially got confronted that this is not real. Yeah. This was his um, statement. There's really something inside of me that is not really convinced that parts of it are not real. I have a feeling that still the parts of that video may be 100% authentic. Oh, jeez. That's like... <laughs> I don't know. Like, that's like a... So, like, I guess the director or whoever, like, told him it was... We'll, we'll I, get to that. We'll get to okay, it in yeah. a moment. We'll get to it. But let's just deal with that. That Later, he is confronted with evidence that this is not... A real alien encounter um and but his biases are just too strong yes isn't that fascinating that like how much somebody wants to believe and i was actually curious i was earlier today searching on reddit on the ufo uh subreddits for mcpherson tape to see what people were saying about it and you can find threads still of people to this year of people vaguely convinced that it's either actually real or some parts of it are real and um like i'll be getting more into that a little bit later uh one of the really interesting things um one of the common threads i was reading and the person that like still thinks that parts of this movie is real you know how you were talking about how authentic um, yeah. The dialogue came across. That was one of their arguments that this had to be real. Is that there's scenes when people are panicking and they're talking all over each other, and that's not normally how movies are structured. And that person is actually 100% correct in that that's not normally how movies are structured. But that doesn't make this authentic footage of an alien, like alien encounter. Right. right. Yeah. No. No. Exactly. I mean, like, I mean, by by that logic, the Blair Witch is real, right? Like, I mean. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And like, like that is, there is, um, for good or bad, I honestly argue as a movie quality bad, but it's one of the things that has led, like now we're getting back to what you were talking about earlier. And I said, like, we come back around to this is that if you read around what people talk about in the UFO community, what convinces them that this movie is real is because of how the family acts mm-hmm. and that they, they're not bad actors like they're not acting like people in a low budget movie that don't know how to act but they're also right. not acting like professional actors and no it's and that's mentally when people are looking to it and they want want to believe it's real that mentally fucks with them i could see that i could see that because like yeah i mean that was one of the things that really struck me like i mean it, it really was i mean 
like I, I'm saying it's a high point for the film, but I feel like if other things in the movie had been done better, like it would have, you know, helped. But um, yeah, like, I mean, I was just totally struck by the authenticness of it. So I could see how it would mess with somebody's head if they really wanted to buy in to what this movie, what they believe this movie actually is. Um. Yeah, so so like I, I just found like that fact that you can still find like people on Reddit today talking about it very fascinating. And I wanna now bring up also that was present at that nineteen ninety three Las Vegas UFO convention. <laughs> uh was one former Lieutenant Colonel Air Force Intelligence Officer Donald Ware. Mm-hmm. Um W A R E, I believe I'm where is I'm guessing yeah. how his name is pronounced. Okay, thank yep. you. And um, I'm, I I'll be talking about more about him in just a moment. But uh, here's some of his quotes. Um, I've been studying. I've been studying UFOs for 42 years, and I've got a pretty good track record. I thought it did not have have the appearance of being a scripted production because everyone was talking at the same time and Hmm. you couldn't understand half of what they said. The people on camera did express a great deal of emotion. If they were actors, they ought to get an Oscar or an Emmy. He continues, I am not convinced the thing is a hoax because I know that our government policy is to insert disinformation into every major UFO case, release a document, or possibly every home video that gets on the market. The reason is to keep the public from getting too excited about our alien visitors, hence the sticker that was on the back of the videos saying that this is a dramatization which allows people not to accept, not to accept it if they don't have to. Wow. So I'm like, oh, former U.S. lieutenant colonel uh, and worked in intelligence. I'm very, very curious about what this guy's background is. So I I, I looked him up. Um, He has a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Duke University, a Master's in Science of Nuclear Engineering from the Air Force Institute of Technology. That's pretty fucking crazy. Smart guy. I mean, you know. He, He spent years as a fighter pilot. Um, and he, um, oh God, where, why did I not have, I thought it was right there pulled up. Um, um, uh, he, uh, he, he worked in government for, um, until he was 47 years old. Um, he retired when he was 47, went into military when, uh, either eight, probably around 18 of that basically spent his whole working life and quite an accomplished person quite an accomplished person. So I was looking up about him and he actually got into aliens. While, according to him, he got into aliens when he was in the military because he claims that he observed, as he puts it, alien vehicles on nine separate occasions. Oh, wow. Now, now this is really interesting because when you look into his stories of what he describes, of seeing the alien vehicles, it is during his time of, um, like the story that really stood out to me is a time that when he was a fight, fighter pilot and describing an object that he could see, but he couldn't fully make it out, but he could just tell it wasn't a vehicle that was flying in airspace. And no matter how fast he went, he couldn't catch up to it. And if you look at, um, a lot of the recent UFO disclosure that's been going on yeah. in recent years, his stories that he describes in his time in the military match up very much with yes. the stories that are being disclosed. So I'm actually inclined to believe that he did witness real phenomena. And I'm not saying it's aliens, but he witnessed something that we don't have an explanation for. And mm-hmm. for anyone listening, um, there's too much for me to go into for this in this episode to bring it up that'd be a whole nother fucking two hour long discussion yeah but if you haven't been paying attention to anything that the u.s government has been disclosing about ufos you i highly recommend um spending an hour or two uh get stoned drink a beer whatever your 
vice of choices and dig deep into it because it's actually really interesting what all, nobody's claiming there's aliens absolutely anyone that's anyone that's telling you the u.s government said aliens are real is lying or doesn't fucking understand what's actually being said and reported but what is being said and reported is both private pilots and government pilots across the entire world have been for decades reporting strange phenomenon in the sky, which literally nobody can explain. And the stuff is essentially being declassified with literal notes attached to it of if anyone in the public has any idea what people are seeing, contact us. Um, it's just weird um, things in the sky. Yeah, yeah, and, so and they uh, they they weirdly look like uh, the uh, the spheres from the Phantasm movies uh, in a lot the of mo- the uh, footage. The most common <laughs> description is a sphere within a translucent cube. Oh yeah, that's right. That's yeah. the most common description that pilots are reporting, and nobody has any fucking idea what the hell people are seeing. Yeah. Um, but it's fascinating, and this is all real. This, see, this is actually real. This is actually documented across the entire world, both the private and public se- sector, multiple governments. Part of the things that's being disclosed is because the United States government, it turns out, and this is part of being, things being disclosed, has been in contact with other governments being like, are you seeing these things? Yeah. And they're like, yeah, we're seeing these things too. Do you know what they are? We don't know what they are. Are they <laughs> yours? No, they're not ours either. And so it's just straight up wow. there's things in the sky that nobody knows what they are. Damn. So that's fun. It's like the world is still a magical place. We have not it figured is. everything out. There are still weird mysteries out there. However, that doesn't mean they're aliens. And let's get back to uh, Donald Ware. So after he got out of the military, he kind of found himself he, – he started getting into aliens and UFOs in the military because he chalked up the weird things he saw as alien life. Mm-hmm. And now um, – he also appears from reading through his stuff. He also apparently got into a weird evangelical religious uh, kick, which is not uncommon amongst serious UFO people. And that he also believes that angels and aliens are related to each yeah, other. Yeah, I've and run this actually, that. as crazy as this all sounds, this actually will all tie back directly into the movie, believe it or not. Um, Jesus Christ, this is insane. So, uh, um, uh, yeah, just saying that he believes in angels. Like, even though I have this all prepared in front of me, that still just like derailed me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so he ended up as being the he joined um, Mufon. Have you ever heard of Mufon? No. Um. M-U-F-O-N. I forget what it stands for, and I don't really give a shit to look it up. Um, but it's the largest organized, quote-unquote, organized group of UFO researchers in the world. And okay. he was made director of it from 1993 to 2010. And he got voted out and removed from his post in 2010. And if you're curious about why he got voted out and removed, which I was... Um, it, it turns out it was because MUFON likes to pride itself of doing quote unquote serious scientific investigation into alien encounters. Um, so in other words, attempting to collect evidence right. of otherworldly contact. Um, he believed, though, that towards the end of his run, he believed that they were focusing too much on material evidence and they should be focusing as much on spiritual evidence evidence Ah. and that's when he got removed from his post um though however he i'm I'm actually not sure if this guy is still alive or not his website is down and it's surprisingly difficult to find any remotely current information on him i say um any remote i couldn't find any current information on him Mm -hmm. i couldn't find any notes that he died but i couldn't find anything from him that wasn't like a decade old document online. So, um, and the last I could find is that he was, um, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. He was, uh, he was director of MUFON from 89 to 93. And then he was director of the international UFO conference from 93 to 2010. 93 okay. is when they screened, um, he ran the convention. So in right. other words, they were like, we can't have you be in the face of our organization anymore, but you can still be involved with us. You can help us plan our biggest event. 
yeah. or you can yeah. run our biggest event. So he wasn't ostracized from the community or the organization. It was just now you're talking about angels. You can't you right. can't be the face of it anymore. I want to point out, though, that he was director in 93, which is when they screened uh, this movie, the movie. That's not the tie back, though. Tie back is that he is a big believer in the theory that there were multiple alien races that have made contact with Earth, and there's a specific one, the Greys, which yes. most people, especially us millennials, uh, know from the X-Files TV show. And a big thing with the Greys is, it depends upon who you ask, but they're essentially a dying alien race for a variety of reasons, depending upon who you ask. And they're trying to breed with humans and doing some sort of breeding program with humans. Um, in the American Horror Story two-parter season, the Death Valley uh, um, four-parter, which I love, is based on this theory. And everything in that four-parter, I, I think it's so funny about that is a somebody that's like i'm a serious conspiracy nerd i'm into all this fucking shit that death valley uh storyline in american horror story is a hundred percent all direct every single thing in it is all directly taken from quote unquote real conspiracy theories and people mock that uh storyline for being so unrealistic and stupid and like there's a lot of people including former is, uh... american military officers that think everything in that is real yeah now so he is a big believer in the grays like cross breeding thing he thought um mcpherson tape was evidence and documentation of that Oh wow! That that it was the the Greys coming essentially coming to get people for their breeding program. Interesting. I mean, yeah. <laughs> what did he base that on? Like just the fact that the Greys are in the movie, or like? Yes, yes, because it's yeah. documentation of the Greys contacting. Okay humans and yeah i was just wondering if, if there were any plot points that he based it on like but i i can't think of any and i would like to also take this time to point out that there is behind the scenes photographs of the three little girls that were hired to play the aliens in the alien both in the alien costumes and them taking their masks off and them holding their masks there's literally mm -hmm. no debate over this so now Let's flash forward here. So we're in 93. We're in we're essentially in 1993 here. My God, I saw so much more to the story. Like this is, like I said, this, this episode, I've got a story. I have a report that I have put together for everyone. Um, uh, Dean Alito gets contacted by the TV show Encounters. Do you remember Encounters? I remember encounters, uh, but I haven't given it a thought to. I was researching this episode. It I was remember, on Fox. I remember sightings, and I think sightings was on right after encounters. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe it was, it was the other way around. I don't know. Yeah, there was it, there was both both those shows, and yeah, people telling their supernatural stories. Yeah. Dean Alito gets contacted by encounters, being like, "Hey, there's this." movie there's this film clip going around ufo abduction do you know anything about it <laughs> and he's like uh yeah that's my movie it was lost in a fire years ago like five years ago well, why are you talking to me about it it's getting passed around the ufo community and they think it's real oh god so encounters did an episode on ufo abduction where they had on um our esteemed uh friend tom dongo the respected ufo researcher mm -hmm. and former lieutenant colonel donald ware to talk about how this was an uh accurate thing uh, accurate um, i'm sorry not accurate um it was evidence of yeah alien encounter and they had on dean alito to be like no this is my movie this is how much i spent to make it this is how i made it those are my friends that's the name here i have photographs of behind the scenes here's yeah here's yeah, yeah girls as aliens and as we both just saw when I was reading those quotes, when they were confronted in the episode with evidence that this isn't real, neither one of them could admit that they were wrong. That's incredible. Isn't that? Yeah. 
Oh, man. <laughs> All right. Are we ready to move on to the next part of the story? Because yeah. it keeps going. It keeps going here. So flash forward to around 1997. X-Files is getting really popular. And um, uh, Dean Alito is having a conversation. So by this point, Dean Alito has gotten now his movie back. It's a VHS bootleg, which ironically only works better for his movie. Like the yeah. decreased film quality actually only makes his movie better. But now he actually has – it may be a degraded VH bootleg, but his movie still exists. He has it. And it's still now only on the bootleg circle. And it was probably after – I'm betting after – it was after that um, – was it Encounters, I say it was? Encounters, yeah, Encounters yeah. episode. That's what it was. Um, uh, that's I'm betting that's probably when it started to cross over into the horror bootlegging community. Mm-hmm. Because they were like, oh, a homemade alien abduction movie that fooled a bunch of dumb UFO researchers. That sounds <laughs> totally like something that then would take off in the horror community. Yeah. And so I'm guessing that's how it got introduced there. And so um, uh, Alito tells the story that he had a Hollywood friend of his that was hanging out with him one night. And it was like, um, like I heard you made a movie in that. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I made a, a little bunch of horror movie. And he's like, I'd like to see it. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, it's not good. And he's like, oh, let me show it. Let me show it. Let me see it. And talks him into it. He's chosen the movie. And the guy's like, I bet you we can get another movie made for you. And... He's like, what? And the guy was aware of the whole encounters thing and the whole, like, people believing that the movie was real. And he's like, here, let me set up a meeting with you. There's this new uh, um, television station called, um, oh, shit. It was I UPN, sure. wasn't it? UPN, thank, thank you. Like, I wanted to make sure I got it right. There's this new uh, television station, UPN. Uh, I can get you a meeting with them. And so they had a meeting with UPN. And what Dino Lito says was what the whole meeting was. He didn't say anything. His friend did all the talking. They went in. They showed a three minute compiled clips of the encounters episode mm-hmm. of all these UFO people swearing it was real. And then his pitch was, we want to remake it. And UP, um, UPN says, yes. And. Cool. Dean Alito said it was the shortest and easiest Hollywood meeting he's ever been in or he's ever heard of. Um, yeah. And so they were given, I think it was a million and a half dollars to go film a remake of it. Um, yeah, let's go with a million and a half dollars. Oh, no, it was one point two five million dollars. One point two five million dollars. So a million were, and a quarter. Yeah, that they were given to remake it quite the jump up in budget. Um and they went and they remade it. And I also like to point out, this is still one year before Blair Witch Project comes out. Yeah. Now, the original film that they turn in, which is what I watched in, in research for this episode, honestly is almost a direct remake with all the faults of oh, wow. the original McPherson tape. Honest to God, I don't have a recommendation of one above the other. Um Technically, Alien Abduction is better made, and we'll get, I'll get into why it is in just a moment here. But um, UFO Abduction, like it, it's it's really the highlights of both are the same, and it's pretty similar quality. Apparently, they got people who worked on special effects on the X Files to do special effects for Alien Abduction. Special effects, yes, are better, but they're still not that much better. It's a made-for-TV movie. Um, and, but what's really interesting about it is it's two hours instead of one hour. Um, or I'm sorry, it's 90 minutes instead of an hour. And what makes up half the movie is interviews with quote-unquote experts talking about if the footage is real or not. Oh. Which also kind of reminded me a little bit of Blair Witch Project. We've talked about before in a previous episode. I forget which one. The Curse of the Blair Witch. Yeah. yeah, the Curse of the Blair Witch, how originally that was part of – the Blair Witch Project, yeah. and they re-edited things for it to be two releases. They do the documentary about the footage in this. That's cool. I thought that was inter- I thought that was interesting that he was actually thinking a lot of the same things that the Blair Witch people were at roughly the exact same time. Yeah. That's so, um, so while he while they are filming this movie though. 
everyone, essentially everyone but one person at UPN that was working with them on the project gets fired. They come back to a whole new staff with this movie that UPN paid for, and they show them it, and the new staff has no idea what the fuck they're watching. <laughs> <laughs> and they are shocked and horrified that they just spent a million and a half dollars on this movie. Oh no. But it's already they already paid for it. They have contracts and everything. So what they do, instead of giving it a two hour block, they edit it down to an hour. So it's essentially just a direct the hour long version is essentially just a direct um remember I should say forty five minutes, because when I'm saying an hour and two hours, this includes commercial breaks. Okay. Um the hour long version is essentially just it cuts out all the talking head stuff and it's just straight up UFO abduction, a.k.a. the McPherson tape direct remake of it. Um, they screen it on a Tuesday night at 9 p.m. and it has the highest ratings across all uh, basic channels. Surprise hit. Yeah. They then the next week re aired the quote unquote expanded version which is actually the version that they turned in. And it once again is a ratings hit. However, after that, it never airs again, and they never want to work with Dean Alito again. And Dean Alito is convinced, and I think this is actually probably correct, that the management was actually embarrassed by how much they misjudged the success. And it's one of those things yeah. where people higher up don't want to admit that they made a mistake and were wrong and that they actually had a right. surprise hit on their hand and they were too full of themselves and they too, too much wanted to make their mark on the company and not let somebody else have the success. And gotcha. this is a common theme in the film industry. You, hear oh, about, yeah. you can hear about it all the time of people high up money, money, money and people essentially sabotaging projects because they don't want someone that was there before them to get credit. They want yeah. the person who was there before them to be proven to be a failure. That's why they deserve the position. And they had a surprise yeah. hit on their hands here with this. And um, they didn't know. They didn't know what to do with it. And it also proved that their gut instinct was wrong. Um, so essentially it got buried. Here's where things keep getting interesting with the story. Is that the rights were sold to um, international markets. And for an unknown reason, it's seriously not known why, uh, most likely people in TV st studios pulling pranks, several international markets aired the movie with, once again, the end credits removed and with a message presented before it that the authenticity of the footage you're about to watch is still under dispute. Oh, shit. <laughs> Which uh, further led to complications of people thinking that they were watching something real, and this was happening in international markets. Now, this is the late 90s. We're about to get into the internet era here. Now, I do want to point out with the um, with the remake, the remake is where McPherson um, yeah. comes in. The, the name McPherson comes into play. And it right. is the McPherson family in the remake i do want to point out at no point ever was the remake ever released anywhere under the title the mcpherson tape mm -hmm. how did i get attached to the original movie once again that's a mystery nobody knows nobody knows so now so now we have out here a second movie in which is being aired in some countries deliberately misleading cutting off the credits and not presenting it as a movie. Right. Now the internet's about to come into play. And so the oh internet boy. comes into play and what happens is across various UFO message boards, and you can still find this confusion on them to this day, is people using the term McPherson tape interchangeably for the original and the remake. And there's a narrative that goes around in UFO communities that the remake was actually a government funded psyop to distract uh. people from the original movie, which is the real footage, and that Dean Alito is actually working for the 
government that help cover up the existence of the real footage. I love it. I love okay, it. You you ready for things about to get more complicated? Yeah. Also on the UFO internet boards, there is so we have UFO abduction, the original movie. We have alien abduction in Southern Lake County, the remake. And then there's like, no, there's a third movie, the McPherson tape. The McPherson tape is actually the real one. When you think you're watching the McPherson tape, you're watching UFO abduction. No, that's a movie. You're watching alien abduction in Southern Lake County. No, that's a movie. McPherson tape, that's the real one. I've seen it, but it's uh-huh. scrubbed from everywhere. You can't find it anymore, but I saw it once. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and honestly, that brings us to modern day where this movie in some corners of the Internet you will see, you will still find people debating about the authenticity of this footage, and if it's uh, if it's real or not, which is absolute insanity. Which I do want to say here, I want to, I want to have this quote here from um, Alito from the from the episode of yeah. Encounters. I'm curious what he thinks of all this, like you know, like uh, because like you make. It, it it's just kind of weird to wrap your brain around like you you're you're this filmmaker or or an artist of any kind and you make a thing that people think has like this remember he thought it was lost for four years he had no yeah. idea it was being passed around in ufo circles right right yeah so here's his quote um from that episode of encounters um I didn't intend for this to be a hoax at all. My goal was to make the most realistic UFO abduction tape possible, but this was beyond my wildest dreams. It was a huge compliment to the cast and crew that a ufologist, scientist, and a colonel believed that this was an actual tape and actual documentation of someone being abducted. It cracked me up. (laughs) And if you read interviews with him, that is always his tone. He has a semi-mocking tone of, like, I cannot believe anyone actually thought this was real. Yeah. He's like, I tried to make a scary horror movie. I was trying to scare people, not convince people that aliens were real. Oh, man. And for the record, I actually haven't seen him comment on it anywhere, but I don't think he thinks aliens are real. He talks about his inspirations for the movie being E.T., uh... Close Encounters of the Third Kind and War of the Worlds. He's a sci-fi nerd. Right, right. Like, he's not actually, like, and he also talks about being an X-Files fan. And that, Ooh. like, he's not, he, he's he's not a ufologist. <laughs> no, no, clearly not. Oh, that is, um... And I do want to point out that... That's Gene, crazy that the remake caused a stir, too. Like, I, I just yes! I can't get over that. And like, the funny I thing mean, is, the remake, in the minds of the people who wanted to believe it, the remake provided more evidence that the yeah. original was real. Because they were trying to squash the original. And it's worth pointing out that the original was unavailable in any official home video form until relatively recently. It was not that many years ago when it finally got an official home release that it exited. No, I mean, yeah, it was essentially lost media in a way. I mean, like... I knew it from the bootlegging circles. I remember it being around in the 90s in the bootlegging circles. And so that's, like, where it existed. Yeah. I mean, when when it came out on Shudder, like, I was... I, I mean, I was shocked that there was an 80s movie I hadn't heard of, and it involved aliens. And I was just like... I also want to point out something really fun here, that this is legit the only found footage movie that is literally actual found footage, because even the creator believed it to be a lost film, (laughs) and and it was found in the bootlegging communities. Oh my god, that's that's good. Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun? Yeah, that is super fun. That's super fun. Now, I also um, want to kind of point out here um, that, like, pretty much everyone involved in this movie didn't go on to do anything else. 
Yeah. Being the lead of that, however, is we may we may remained involved in filmmaking. Uh, like his last movie came out in 2019. Um, I gotta be honest, I don't really recognize a lot of his uh, uh, t- uh, filmography. Is he but still he's, directing or, or like? He's directing. Oh no, he's oh, directing, wow. and he's also he also has like a lot of TV credits, um, admittedly for shows I've never heard of. But whatever, the guy is still to this day. He even has upcoming projects listed. Cool. Um, he is still to this day, uh, like working in the film industry. So that's super fucking cool for him. Like, I'm very happy to hear that. And I do want to point out special attention to um, the uh, what's his name, um, Bill Bowes. Bill Bowes, who was the sole person doing special effects on UFO abduction and McPherson tape. One guy built and did everything. And that was his first credit in a long special effects history career of him working in the art department and production design and special effects for such movies as, let me name a few here, The Nightmare Before Christmas, Sleepy Hollow, Series cool. of Unfortunate Events, Mad God, which we did an episode about. Oh, yeah. Monkey yeah. Bone, which I loved and nobody else did. Um, <laughs> James Gunn's Scooby Doo. Um, Eli, a movie that you were just talking oh, about that hell you yeah, really liked. Dude. Hell yeah. He also worked on Happy Happy Death Day to You. He um he worked on um the Smurfs too, Sinister Two, um something called Beverly Hill Chihuahua, which is a whatever. But this guy's had a now a long career, still working to this day in many movies, working on art and production. So that's super cool. cool. Two people did get long careers out of this movie um so yeah i actually think that this i i was like man when i was researching for this episode i was i like i knew that this was going to be a fun one that this is one of the more interesting stories surrounding a movie that we've covered thus far on this show i believe yeah i think so too i think so too because like you wouldn't you wouldn't have been in that conference room in 1993 in Las Vegas watching a room full of UFO Just, believers watch yeah. this movie? And then apparently it erupted a gigantic debate over whether or not what they watch is real. It's cliche. That yeah, it's cliche amazing. to say, but I would I would love to be a fly on that wall, you know? <laughs> um, oh, my God, that had to have been amazing. Yeah. And like I said, you can go on Reddit to this day and go to the UFO subreddits and search for this movie and there are still people debating is is it real is it not is the remake um meant to cover up the original is psyop exactly is the remake of psyop is some of the footage in the movies real and some of it's fake um it's like people it's it's also fascinating looking into this movie of it being an example of like so we're War of the Worlds, when it came out, that whole story about people believing it was real is really, really overblown. Really, really overblown. There is some examples of some people believing it's real, but it's it's really an overblown story. However, people, even those that did think it was real, you don't find anybody arguing in the modern, anyone arguing these days, you don't find anyone arguing 10 years after War of the Worlds, the radio broadcast came out, that it was actually right. real. Um, and there was, I know, another um, uh, Blair Witch Project. I'm bewildered by this. I truly had no idea if some people thought it was real or not. I've talked about this before, that the Blair Witch Project was filmed in the area that I grew up in, yeah. and it was a covered in local newspapers because it was a big deal that a movie was being filmed in our era because no movies are fucking filmed in that part of Pennsylvania and Maryland. And so it was all over the local newspapers. So when I, w- when I went to go see the movie, as a teenager, I, I wasn't 18 yet, I had to sneak into the theater. I suck into the oh, Blair Witch wow. Project. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because some of the theaters in my areas were dicks about laying you in if you were under uh, 17 to see an R-rated movie. And I wasn't I wasn't 17. My uh, friends and I snuck into the Blair Witch Project. Um, it was That's always a good easy. First, uh, first movie to sneak into. Oh, no, it was, far, it was far from our first we snuck into. Oh, okay. No, what you always do is you just go up and you just buy tickets for – some, whatever else whatever yeah, yeah, else yeah. and then when you when you get past the ticket checker you just duck into the theater that 
of the movie you want to see. Anyone that's underage listening to this podcast, I know I'm not allowed to advocate for federal crimes anymore, but I believe I can advocate for sneaking in the movies, R-rated movies, when you're underage. That's not yeah. breaking any law. It's not oh, breaking no, any I law. Saw, uh, when I saw Evil Dead Rise, and this this is just like, it made me feel old, but it also made me feel a little special. I had this this couple that was out on a date. They were, they were like teenagers, and they were like, hey – Will you like pretend to be one of our dads? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I totally have bought uh, tickets for uh, RA movies for kids. I mean, I have a hundred percent done that. Yeah. And, and the, like, 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 like I couldn't pass. I, I don't really, you can't really pass for a dad, but I could be like, like, can you be our like cousin or whatever? Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, totally. I'll, I'll buy your kids. I'll buy you kids your tickets. Yeah. <laughs> I have a hundred percent done that. I don't think there's anything immoral or wrong about no. teenagers sneaking into R rated movies. It's part of the, beauty of growing up more uh, absolutely. kids if you're, if you're underage sneak into more r-rated movies that's my message to you um fuck how did i get down this route oh but blair witch project um i was amazed when i found out later that there were some segments of the population that legit thought the blair witch project was real when it came out so i so i didn't think it was real when i saw it but during the marketing, I I wasn't sure what they were advertising. I was like, are they are they advertising a movie or are they advertising or is it not not something real, but like something that was like claiming to be real, like like the show Encounters or like the show mm-hmm. Sightings, but as a feature length film. Like I was I wasn't sure like what was being presented to me until I walked in and watched the movie, and I was like, oh, this is a movie, and it's just oh. a different like. Yeah. I know when we talked about this really in depthly, it was in the Campbell Holocaust episode because that was another movie that even yeah. got to the degree that the director, um, uh, Ruggiero Diodato, did I say his name yeah. right? Yeah, you Man, did. yes, excellent. That only took how it, how long? Yeah, yeah, you're you're good at pronouncing the names that matter. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting I'm getting better. I'm getting doing this show. I'm getting better at pronunciation of foreign names. I'm getting better at it. Yeah. Um, or or I should say non, uh, Anglo. Sure. names uh, i'm getting better at it um but uh like yeah that that movie had the director brought to court because they thought it was legit he had to show them couched. how he did the special effect and like yes, bring and all pro- the actors in and be like prove they were dead. dead like yeah go listen to our campbell holocaust episode for the whole breakdown on that fun fact and you have to listen to the episode to find out about it there is actually real human death footage in the movie and it's something that like nobody talks about Go listen to the episode. Yeah. Um, I'm really well, proud of that episode. Not shot guys. by Diodato. No, it's like no, no, stock no. Footage Don't whatever, give them too much away. I'm sorry. They have I'm sorry. To go listen. Yeah. Make go in the archives. To listen to our episode. It's, a, that's it's one of our best. It's an advertisement. Yeah, it's one of our best yeah. episodes. And so I find it interesting that we're back here again to a movie um, that some people believed it was real. Though this one's different. That this one, we still have people arguing to this day that at least portions of it may be real. Yeah. And it's real its distribution method is unlike anything we ever discussed because this existed in bootleg circles before it had any sort of real release and it wasn't film bootleg circles. It was right. essentially UFO researchers, paranormal believers, that whole end of things those were the people that were passing around the tape. Yeah. And that is absolutely fascinating to me. And I think that makes us an incredibly unique genre artifact that I'm really, really happy we did an episode. Yeah. About. It's up there with, uh, it's up there with ghost watch. I, I would say as far as like, um, yeah, but like, it's still like, it's still in its own league, but I mean, I'm saying like, you know, as far as like stuff that had like, just, how it's bled yeah. over into the real world. Yeah, once yeah. again, go listen to our Ghost Watch episode. Another example of a movie people thought were real. Um, though that one, we go over in the Ghost Watch episode, they did do like absolutely everything in their power to convince people it was real. <laughs> yes, it was, it was, uh, uh, yeah, the BBC like basically like <laughs> pranked us. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, go listen to our Ghost Watch episode. Another good episode I'm really proud of that we did with lots of interesting stories about it. Yeah. But yeah, th- this this movie, um, um, I th- that's pretty much everything I have for its research. All of my thoughts that I have on it. I mean, 
the story around it is just like I like I said before, it's crazy with an emphasis on crazy. Like yeah. it's, there's yeah, a it's... lot of insanity involved in how this movie is still why this movie is still talked about to this day. <laughs> yeah, um totally. Uh it's like almost I would almost say like I mean, yeah, watch the movie, but like also just like read about all this shit, like because or or just listen to our episode, which I mean, they, know, everyone just heard the episode. I just really yeah, what you're doing full, anyway. So full, yeah. full, full story. Um, it's I think it's a movie that the story around the movie is more interesting than the movie itself. Yeah. And I mean, the movie, I have to be honest, like it is it is extremely forward thinking. But as I already said earlier in the episode, my opinion of it is as a movie itself, it's most interesting as a film genre historical artifact that it was thinking ahead really far that people weren't thinking in the horror genre. It was doing a lot of film techniques. Like I said, um, I I am not an expert on film techniques, so I can't make any like full claims on it. However, I am fairly certain and I saw lots of articles by people who understand film techniques more than more than I do that do credit um, McPherson tape, a.k.a. UFO abduction, as the first found footage movie to do a lot of what we now consider the found footage tropes. Yeah, definitely. Like this guy was really forward thinking. However, I already talked about earlier there's a lot of movies that took this idea a lot further, and I feel like this is a movie that, if you're a serious academic horror fan, as Lucas and I are, it's a must-watch, just yes. for its historical significance. It's an absolute must-watch. If you're looking for a fun movie to throw on on a Friday night, I'd recommend a lot of other movies above this. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, I would I would, I would say the uh, UFO uh, slumber party alien abduction there the, <laughs> on VHS too. Um, but uh, what are we what are we gonna do next next time around? What are what are we? I did so um um let's say real quick. So d- what's your opinion? Do you recommend it or no? Oh yeah no I would say definitely check it out for like um. I would say for historical purposes, it's not the most enjoyable film, but it is really cool to see like um, how a lot of these uh, techniques, um, I don't know, I guess originated where they originated. Um, And uh, yeah, I would uh, also recommend like researching, uh, you know, around the movie as well, because it can be, like like you like you said, Jeff, it's um almost It's insane. As, as this movie was itself. screened at a UFO convention in Las Vegas in nineteen ninety-three. Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah, <laughs> and they thought it that. was real. It was being screened not as like a like a fun thing of like, oh, let's all get together and watch the horror movie about aliens. That's not what they were doing. It was yeah. they thought it was real. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man! So next week, um, do you have any ideas for next week? I I did have something I wanted to, I wanted to pitch to you, but I'm gonna see if you had anything first. Um, oh, I really should have that list, but um, so, no, so yeah, I don't really. We've been have kind anything. of like in like a, we've been doing a whole bunch of uh horror related movies in the row here like yeah for, well i mean we do cover horror movies more than and horror related movies more than anything else in the in this podcast we have and, a horror bias yeah we do we we honestly do but we do try to like break out and to like some other genres for other interesting things other interesting insanity and i had such a good time researching the history of this movie especially with its bootleg history that reminded me of another movie on our list that we have to cover and i was wondering if you were feeling if we've gotten to the point that you're brave enough that we cover goodbye uncle tom oh uh okay i don't know where to even watch this 
Um, oh, that I'm is, I'm, I'm sure I can find a way for us to see it. Um, yeah, I, I am absolutely enough. certain I can find a way for us to see it. Because uh, this movie has never been released um, anywhere, to the best of my knowledge. Um, yeah. Oh, it looks like you can watch Official. it on, on the... It's, uh... it's on YouTube. Oh, yeah, and it's on archive.org as well. Um, it's on YouTube. Good God. Uh, oh. It easily, <laughs> easily. Holy shit. Yes. Okay, so the... Do you, um, do you, feel, do you feel comfortable of... Do you feel like you're, you're... Feel comfortable with where we're at in discussing movies on the show to cover Goodbye Uncle Tom? Or do you want to put it off till later and do something else? Oh, man. Um, oh, Jesus. <laughs> I just, yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just reading all the all the notes on uh, the Internet Archive. The person who yeah. uploaded it, they uploaded it, but they definitely hate this movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, let's, yeah, we could do that. Let's yeah, fucking let's do, do it, it dude. So our next movie that we're going to be covering for anyone that's listening that has no idea why Lucas is reacting the way he is, is a, a um, I maybe have some of the details wrong here because I've actually never seen it. Um, the movie was re- recommended to us as a movie we have to cover on this show by my good friend, author, Carlton Mellick III. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to blame Carlton for us covering it. Um, he said we have to cover it. That it's one of the bootlegging holy grails. That it's a Italian mockumentary about filmmakers from the modern day going back in time to document American slave auctions. Yeah. So it's a Italian science fiction <laughs> mockumentary about the American slave trade. I am sure there's going to be nothing offensive or uncouth about oh, this I'm movie sure. we're about to be covering and i'm sure lucas is not going to be blushing and stumbling over his own words as we try to talk about it on our next uh you mean full even movie more episode. than normal <laughs> yes yes <laughs> now i was like let's i I'm researching um researching mcpherson tape i was like i'm gonna do goodbye uncle tom next like the whole lost film history thing i think it's so fascinating yeah. And going into all the reasons why. Fuck, I just even found here a YouTube video, Eli Roth on Goodbye Uncle Tom. And I'm like, okay, like, we've got to cover this. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, That's going to be fun. Um, And then we got to figure out when we're going to get Lombardo on. um, Oh, yes, that's right. Well. Yes, um, uh, I was. Uh, that's right. I need to get back into that conversation. I was out of town. I need to get back. But that's yeah, yeah, not yeah. our recording. I forgot yeah, about totally. that. OK, great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're going to uh, Lucas just dropped. We're going to probably our next guest we're going to have on for an episode is going to be filmmaker Mike Lombardo, who made um, uh, I'm Dreaming of a uh, White Doomsday. White Doomsday. Thank you. I'm Dreaming of a White Doomsday. Uh, we're going to we're not going to be talking about his movie, though. We're gonna be talking about something else, and what that is, yeah. you're gonna have to wait and find out. Yeah, uh, we'll have to wait and find we're, out. We're, we're on we're on Patreon. We're on uh, we're on social media. We're on Facebook. We're on uh, Twitter. Um, our official account isn't as active as it should be. We need to get better at that, Lucas. Yeah. But you can find Lucas and I on Twitter and on Facebook and on Instagram. That's all the places I'm at. Where are you at? I'm on Substack, writing newsletters. Every oh yeah, Monday. Lucas. Lucas has his newsletters. Go 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 subscribe to that. Yeah, totally. And I've been uh, dropping short YouTube videos uh, every Tuesday. So, yeah, talking about uh, spooky horror books that I grew up reading. <laughs> um, uh, but, yeah, um, that's that. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Yes. Oh, my God. Goodbye, Uncle Tom. Next episode. Guaranteed oh to be our most uncomfortable episode. We have two white guys talking about a dying movie commenting on the United States slave trade. Definitely going to be our most awkward episode. Join us next time for that. (laughs) Okay.